Let's um, take a moment to pray. Then we will get started today. Um, could somebody please lead us in prayer this morning? Um, who would like to pray? All right. Um, I'll pray. Please go ahead, Kennedy. Yeah, Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that you've given to us to come into your presence, mm -hmm. to learn your words. I commit everybody in the mighty power of your, your hands over that whatever mm -hmm. we are going to learn, it will be for your honor and glory. I thank you for this word because uh, it gives us a deeper meaning of what we should do and what we should learn, Jehovah. Commit everybody into thy hands in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Thank you for connecting to the class. Uh, BC209, our course on holiness. So in this final section, um, what we have been doing is talking about overcoming. Uh, specifically, how do we overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil so that we can pursue God's call to holiness on our lives. So God has called each of us to holiness. He is a holy God. He has sanctified us. He has made us holy. But now that has to be worked out in our daily life here on earth. And uh, we are living in a, a world where there's so much of sin and all kinds of evil and around us. So the big question for us is, how do we live holy practically as we go through this life on earth? How do we do it? And so we said there are three main areas of challenges, the flesh, the world, and the devil. They are trying to pull us down. And so we spent some time talking about overcoming the flesh, how there are the desires of the flesh that, that are there in this natural body, uh, but we must learn to overcome it with the word of God and the strength and the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And so we talked about that and we talked about some practical things that we can do, you know, to take care of ourselves. Like as I was mentioning on Monday, you know, um, uh, the Bible says, you know, make no provision for the flesh. That means don't give the flesh any chance. Don't give it any opportunity. And so we have to think like that. You know, we have to, uh, in all the, our planning and as we go about our daily work and daily lives, think like that. I, I shouldn't put myself in a place where the flesh can, you know, raise up its head and overpower me in some way and pull me down. I shouldn't put myself in those kinds of situations. So make no provision for the flesh. So these are practical things that we can do as we uh, go about our journey through life. Today, we want to go into the next part, which is overcoming the world. Overcoming the world. So we want to talk about that uh, and address some of the challenges we face and how do we overcome the world. So I'm going to go ahead, share the notes and... All right, so overcoming the world. So what, do, what are the challenges we face as believers as we live in this world? Right? So we know the whole world, the Bible says the whole world lies in the control or under the influence of the wicked one. First John chapter five, verse 19, John writes, he says, you know, we know the whole world is under the 
control of the wicked one. Uh, Satan's influencing so much that's going on uh, in the world around us. So how do we, let me just make sure, First John 5, yeah, 19, right? So uh, how, how do we overcome the world? So if you want to break it down, we could say, look, broadly speaking, there are these three areas of challenges we face. One is worldly influences and attractions. Second is the cares and the pressures of this world. And third, there are the troubles, the persecutions, or we could say the hardships, the trials and the tribulations that are in the world. All of these come against the believer. And uh, none of us uh, are exempt from it, meaning as long as we are alive in this world, we will face these things. It's just part of journeying through this world. We will face it. But the good thing is we can overcome it. We can live victorious over these things. If we, you know, if we understand and if we apply uh, what the Bible teaches us. So let's talk about each of these and then talk about how, what can we do to overcome the world. So worldly influences and attractions. You know, we feel the pull and the pressure of the influence, the attraction of the world. You know, what are some examples we can think of? Um, do you want to share anybody? Yeah, you know, let's just... Uh, uh, just imagine we were all sitting in the same classroom. <laughs> it would be very easy to have some discussions. So, and if we were sitting in the same classroom, uh, I would definitely ask uh, people to share. So, you know, what are some of the, you know, worldly pressures, influences we face? Examples. What do you think? Money? Yeah. You know, uh, we face the pressure and the influence. You know, we see other people, oh, they're making so much money, that person making so much money, that person making so much money. So the influence is there. What else do we face? Family issues. Uh, sorry. Issues. Uh, sorry, can I, what was that again? Family issues. Oh, family. Okay, yes, yes. Family pressures, uh, peer pressure, as Divya said, uh, wrong influences of friends. So we face worldly influences and attractions. You know, sometimes, um, you know, you have a car and then there is, oh, why can't I have a, that kind of a car? You know, a bigger car, a better car, a more luxurious car, whatever. Or you have a house, and then, oh, why can't I have a bigger house? Uh, why can't I have, you know, whatever. So many, so many influences and so many attractions in the world. You know, it comes through us, you know, through so many ways, through the news and social media. And, yeah, I'm seeing what all of you are sharing. Very good. Yeah, through even the mobile phones, <laughs> news and social media. So the worldly influences, worldly attractions come on us, you know. So you have clothes and something. Why can't we have better clothes, you know, or some more fancy looking clothes? Or um, I'm not, you know, see, I'm not against, uh, you know, if you have the money to buy good clothes, by all means, buy the clothes you want. <laughs> but uh, um, the thing is, if we give in to the pressure, and we talk about the pressure, the worldly influence, the worldly attractions, um, uh, the need for, yeah, Christopher says, the power, the need for, you know, being and having control over people, influence over people, power, position, title, uh, fame, uh, yeah, so a lot of these kinds of things, you know, we all feel. Yeah, I mean, different ones of us in different stages of life will feel different things. Um, but all these things are there, that are there. And the believer, the child of God, 
also faces these things. You know, just because you're a child of God, just because we are believers, doesn't mean these worldly influences and worldly attractions are not there. You know, it's there. We face it. So we we must uh, learn learn how to you know live victorious over these things. So there are these uh, worldly influences and attractions. Now think about this. You know, uh, this is a very uh, interesting statement that the apostle Paul made about one of his co-workers. His name was Demas. Yeah. Uh, in Philemon chapter one twenty four, Paul refers to Demas as his fellow worker, his co-worker. Hey, you know, he mentions all his co-workers. You know, and he mentions Demas. But then in the last episode that he wrote, the Apostle Paul wrote, this is what he had to say. He said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed. Now, can you imagine? This is Paul's last episode, Second Timothy chapter 4. He wrote this just before he died, before he was martyred. And uh, it is his closing remarks, his final words. And he says, you know, Demas, who was one of his co-workers, he has forsaken. He left the team. But why did he leave the team? Not because, you know, he had uh, some other problem, but he left the team because he loved this present world. And he has departed. Yeah, that's a very tragic statement to make about a fellow worker in the ministry. Yeah. That he would leave the ministry because he loved this present world. So you can see, you know, how strong the pull of this world must have been that one of the co-workers of the great apostle Paul was pulled back into the world you know so we have to be careful we have to be careful so the bible tells us you know that we must keep ourselves unspotted from the world that means the world is around us but don't let the dirt of the world come on you you know, don't let the the the, the filth and the, all of that let it don't let it just slap itself on you you keep ourselves unspotted from the world. Yet people should see, here's a child of God, and they are above this world. I mean, they are not tainted by the same evil things that are in the world. They are not tainted. This is a child of God. People should see that. You know, that is a mark of difference between a child of God and somebody who is living in the world. Right? The child of God should be unspotted, you know, their garments should not be dirtied by the uh, uh, moral corruption, the decay, the evil that's in the world. Now, the good news is that God has given to us all things that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So for everything we need for life and a godly living. For godliness means to live godly. So he has given to us. Notice the past tense. He has given to us. How? By his power. Through the knowledge of him. That is through our knowing the Lord who called us to glory and virtue. He has given to us everything so that by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That means God has given to us his word, great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, so we share in the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this is the life of the believer. What is it? The believer is able to escape. That means to live free from the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
So there is moral decay in the world because of evil desire. Lust means evil desire. So in the world, there is corruption, moral decay because of all the evil desires. But for the believer, God has given to us everything that we need to live the life in godliness, to live in this world and to live godly in this world. Because we know him who called us to glory and virtue. And he has given us great and precious promises. He's given us his word. So that through the word, we can enjoy the, we can be, you know, live in the divine nature and, and, and escape the, the corruption that's in the world. So it is possible for us as believers to live in this world. We are in this world. All around us, there is the influence. There is the attraction. But it is possible if we make use of what God has given to us. See, if we don't use it, then we will get pulled down. But God has given everything we need to live godly. He's given us great and precious promises, but we got to use them. And if you don't use that, then we can let the influence of this world overpower us. And, you know, in his second episode, Peter, you know, in a, in a kind of a sad way, talks about some people who, in the beginning, they escaped the pollutions of the world. That means they came out of all the filth and the dirt of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But very sadly, they get back into it. They are again entangled in them and overcome by them. This is a very sad thing. And their end is worse than the beginning. So Peter mentions, hey, be careful. Because you and I, we don't want to be part of this group. You know, we start out by coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we escape the pollutions of the world, and then go back and get entangled again and are overcome by the attractions and influences of this world. Then our End is worse than our beginning, you know, but we don't want to be part of that. We want to learn how to live victorious over the world, overcoming the influences and attractions, or like James says, stay unspotted from the world. How do we do that? We must learn. We are going to learn. Second, Part of our challenge in the world is cares, responsibilities, pressures, stresses we face in the world. Yeah, and this is real. Again, this is something we all face. We all face it. You know, like uh, I think Kennedy mentioned, yeah, we face, okay, you're married, you face family pressures. You have a job, there are pressures on the job responsibilities on the job, stress on the job. Uh, there could be financial stress. There could be um, all kinds of you know, stress or expectations from people around us. The cares and the pressures, things that are pushing down upon us. And every believer faces it. And Jesus warned us about this. You know, in the parable of the sower, and we all know this, he said, you know, some seed fall among thorns. Now, what are the thorns? What do the thorns represent? Jesus went on to explain. He said, the thorns actually represent the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches and desire for other things. So that's what the thorns represent. The cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches the desires or the attractions of other things. So it's the world 
So the world can actually choke the word if they are allowed to enter into the life of the believer. You know, so we hear the word of God. So Sunday after Sunday, you go to church, hear the word of God, and maybe sometimes during the week, you can listen, we can listen to sermons, this and that, and read the Bible, all of that. But then if we don't keep the cares of this world, the things of this world, the pressures of this world outside, we don't keep it away. It could come in and it'll choke the word. Yeah. So sometimes we can become overburdened by the cares of this world. So, you know, we can mention some of the cares of this world, like we already did. You know, First Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul is writing about the married person. He says, you know, the married person has to handle the responsibilities of the home, of the marriage. They, you know, the wife has to take care of, I mean, see how she can minister to her husband. The husband has to see how he can minister to the wife. And then they have the family. You know, you've got to take care of your family, of course. Um, and uh, all of those things are there, you know. And we have to be careful that while these are responsibilities we have to fulfill, we can't avoid it. We should not let them become so consuming that they choke the word and they become a care, a burden. And uh, then what happens? The world has overpowered the believer. So there are influences and attractions. There are cares and responsibilities. And the Bible teaches us to cast all our care upon him. Yeah, that is, yeah, we face these pressures, but we have to put it on the Lord. And then the third aspect that we all face from the world is troubles and persecutions. Now, again, there could be so many different kinds of things. Troubles, uh, yeah, there are the storms of life that come, for example, you know, the example, let's say the last couple of years, there was a pandemic. And then uh, it impacted people everywhere. So depending, of course, depending on the kind of jobs that people had, uh, depending on the kind of industries they were working on, many industries, many workplaces had to close because they couldn't continue business. So that impacted the people working there and, you know, um, people faced hardships. It was unexpected, but it affected so many people. And uh, so there could be these unexpected challenges. Sometimes companies close down. Sometimes, uh, you know, people lose their jobs for other reasons. Uh, or they could be all kinds of troubles, you know, there could be, I don't know, there could be political problems, there could be, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, um, weather problems, you know, tornadoes, cyclones, storms, this, that, all kinds of things. So there are all kinds of difficulties, troubles in the world. And sometimes we even face oppositions and persecutions because of our faith. Uh, we may face it in school, college, in the workplace, and so on. So believers face this. Right? Troubles and persecutions, hardships. And Jesus warned us, you know, in John 16, 33, he said, in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Yeah, as long as we're in the world, these things will happen. It's not like uh, we will not face these things. But he has shown us that he has overcome and therefore we too can overcome as we follow what he's taught us. So how do we live as overcomers? 
over the worldly well, influences and attractions, over the cares and the pressures, the troubles and persecutions. How do we live as overcomers through these things? We can't make these things go away. You know, sometimes we, uh, you know, for example, people think, okay, if I go into a monastery or live somewhere in a, in some very remote place, I won't face worldly influences and attractions. Well, possibly to some extent, you know, you if people isolate themselves, maybe, but there are still responsibilities, there are still cares, there are still things they will have to deal with, even inside a monastery or wherever. You know, it's not like everything is gone. There are responsibilities. So, what are practical things the Bible teaches us to do? We'll focus on four biblical instructions. Okay, the first one the Bible teaches us is that we, as believers, and these are for instructions for believers. The first instruction is that we we must set our affections on things above. So, we, and we will talk about how we apply each of these, right? Second, we must stay sanctified by the Word and the Spirit. You, you will find the Word and the Spirit, you know, these two things are common in all areas. So when we talk about the flesh, we mention, use the Word of God, dip in the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the world, same thing, the Word of God and the Spirit. When we talk about the devil, same thing, the Word of God and the Spirit. You know, so the Word of God and the Spirit is common. It just This is how we live. Okay. Number three, we live by faith in God and with a renewed mind. So we must learn to live like this, live differently. And number four, this is the practical side. We have to be spiritually minded, but we also have to be earthly wise. We'll talk about these things. So number one is to set our affections or desires on things above. So what does that mean? You know, I, we can we can put it in you know many ways. Jesus said, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know, so it doesn't mean that I shouldn't want to have or desire for the things in the world. Meaning, if you if you want to you know have a home or a place to a decent place to live or those things, it's not wrong to desire it. But our primary desire, every, our affection is on things above. You know, seek first the kingdom of God. So that's priority. He says, first God's will, God's kingdom. Then all these other things will be added to you. You know what we need for life. Of course, you need money. You need a place to live. You need a, a means of transport. Uh, you whatever all those things will be added to you. Don't worry about it. But first, seek first the kingdom. Or Paul put it like this in Colossians chapter three: it says, "If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek after heavenly things. Desire first and foremost for the things of God, because." That's where our life is. Now, we have been raised with Christ and we are at the right hand of God. So first and foremost, desire those things which are of God. How do we do it? Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is seated with Christ in God. Right? So this is talking about where our affection should be, where our desires should be, where our priority should be, of our mind on things above. Seek those things um, which are above. Okay. So what does it mean? I, we must pursue, yearn for things that are above. We uh, direct our mind uh, and seek for things that are above. We strive for those things. Right. So that's our priority. That's where our affection is. So what is the thing that we really want most? God, I want your kingdom. I want to please your heart. I want to be pleasing to you. 
I want to do your will for my life. I, I want the things of things which are above. That's priority. Now, there's nothing wrong if we also attend to natural things. Example, you know, if you are a if you are a young person, you're going through college. Of course, you would desire to finish your studies. You would desire to get a job, a good job. You would desire to make a good salary. Um, uh, you would desire to, you know, have a place, good place to live, you know, good clothes to wear. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those desires. But those desires are in the right place, meaning they come, or let me put it like this, your, but your foremost desire is things which are about God, my heart is on you. I want to do your will. And all these other things, of course, I will, you know, enjoy them. They're good things, but they're all serving a higher purpose, which is the kingdom of God, which is doing the will of God for my life, which is pleasing the heart of God, which is glorifying God. So in your studies, in your career, in your job, in your finances, in your home, in your in the, in, the, in the clothes you wear, in everything. All these other things are only serving a higher purpose, which is pleasing the heart of God. So while we do have these goals and these desires, they don't control us. They don't control us. So for example, uh, John writes in First John 2, 16 and 17, he says, you know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. He says, don't love the world. See, there are, the world offers the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So that's what, you know, it's, it, it attracts your eyes. It appeals to your evil desires of the flesh. It appeals to our pride, our sense of, you know, achievement and all those things. That's what the world is trying to, uh, to, trying to attack. But he says, don't love those things because it's all passing away. It's going away. It's here and gone. It's here and gone. But he who does the will of God, he abides. So our focus is on doing the will of God. Right? So the first thing is, where is our affections? What is the things that, what are the things that really please you? What are your real desires? The desire for the things of God must be more than the natural goals that we pursue. So we have to understand this, right? It's not wrong to have practical goals, like you know, finishing education or all those practical things like I've just mentioned. It's not wrong, but those are in a, in a, they're all serving a higher purpose. They're all connected to a greater desire, which is to please the heart of God, do the will of God, seek first the kingdom. Our affections are set on things about, or James chapter 4, verse 4, I think we referenced it in uh, last class, you know, where Devi brought that question up. Uh, if, any, uh, if any man is a friend of the world, he's an enemy, he's an enemy of God. Excuse me. So uh, I can't have friendship with the world. So my friendship is with God. And of course, I engage with the world because, you know, we live in it and we have to practically get things done. So we engage with the world, but our friendship is with God. Our friendship is not with the world. That means our affections, our desires are in the things of God. The world, we practically engage to do the things we have to do. Right? The Apostle Paul put it like this, and in, 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 in I like these scriptures here in Galatians 2 and Galatians 6. Paul says, 
I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying, you know what? I died with Christ. I died. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And just think about it. Take some time to think about that. I, that is the me with my desires, my affections, my priority, that me is dead. I crucified with Christ. So it's no longer I, but it's Christ living in me. That means everything about me now is subject to, and it's coming around, out of, and it's centered around Christ. Christ is living in me. So his desires are being expressed through me. His priorities are expressed through me. Christ lives in me. And he says, but of course it's Paul living, right? It doesn't mean that Jesus came in and kicked Paul out. That's not, that's not, it's Paul living, but Paul is living in such a way that it is Christ living in him. And he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. So how do I do this? How do I practically live out Christ in me? I live by faith in the Son of God. Right? Another in the same in the epistle to Galatians, Paul says, you know, I, I will not boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So think about this. He's living in this world, but the world is dead. He is dead to the world and the world is dead to him. That means, yeah, I know there are all these things in the world, but I'm not after it. I'm not after it. I know those things are there. I know I can achieve things. You know, if you know, we engage in the world, we can be very successful. We can make a lot of money. We can, uh, you know, have position, power, influence, fame, success. Sure we can. But that's not what we are living after. The world is crucified to me, I to the world. And that doesn't mean if God has called you to be a businessman, you shouldn't be a successful businessman or, you know, whatever you're doing, you do it. But that itself is not what consumes us. And the world is crucified to me, I to the world. Yeah. So the cross, the cross is a place of separation, separates us from the world. And Jesus told us, he said, you know, we take up our cross daily. That means every day I'm living separated because I'm carrying my cross daily. The cross is a place of separation. And I'm, every day I'm living separated from the world. Now, how do we practically live it out? You know, uh, does it mean we all have to quit our jobs and we all have to, you know, or forsake living in this world and what do we do? No. Each one of us have to do what God's called us to do. Some may be called to be business people. Some may be called to, you know, to engage with the world in various ways. And uh, while we do that, we are trusting in the living God. We're not trusting in the riches or the success or the accomplishments or the position, the power, the influence. We're not trusting in that. But our trust is in the living God. And whatever he gives us to enjoy, we enjoy it. You know, God to each of, to each of us, we will have different things that we can enjoy. Some may enjoy, you know, success as businessmen. Some may enjoy, you know, power, position, money, Wealth, uh, all the, okay. God's given it to you. Enjoy it. And we are also rich in good works. That means we use that to bless others. 
We use what God has given to us to help others. Right? So that's the mindset here that I'm in this world, but the world is not going to control me. I'm an overcomer. I'm going to do my first and foremost affection is on God. And according to what God has given to each of us, whatever he's called us to do, uh, we do it. Our trust is always in God, not in the wealth or the money or the power, the position or the fame. Uh, we enjoy what he's given to us. It's nice. But we use what he's given to us to bless other lives, to serve the purposes of the kingdom. So uh, in, in Ecclesiastes, he says, you know, God has given to every man that you eat and drink and enjoy your labor. That's a gift of God. That you enjoy your labor, the good of all your labor. So there's nothing wrong if you enjoy your working, you enjoy the good, the fruit of your labor. That's a gift of God. Right? So what, what must we do? First of all is our affections are set on God on the things of God, while we pursue whatever God has given to each of us, you know. So I remember when I was running my business, I'll just share a little bit and then I'll open up time for questions. So, you know, the, I spent about 18 years or so, um, something like that, yeah, you know, working in the IT industry. I was working in the U.S. and then moved back to India and started my own business while we were pioneering the church. And so I've stayed, you know, during that time, I, I you know, traveled to different countries, uh, traveled through many countries in Europe, traveled through uh, the Pacific, I traveled through North America. So I stayed in some of the best hotels, you know, like big seven-star hotels. Um, uh, it, but it didn't didn't bother me. So I stayed as I got. Thank you. I have the opportunity. I've, I'm here on business, so you know companies pay the money, pay for this. It's okay. I'll, I'll stay and enjoy it. But it doesn't change who I am. I'm still a child of God. I'm still a minister of God. I could stay in a seven star hotel. It doesn't matter. You know, it's fine. But. You know, I remember one particular year in the beginning of the month or so, I was staying in this fancy hotel in Australia. Came back to India. I went on a missions trip and I was like some remote part of India. And I was staying in some tiny village. So I said, God, I'm fine. Doesn't matter to me. For me, I am serving God. When I was on business, I was staying in one of the best hotels that was there. I'm here going to preach and I'm staying in a remote village in a small little room. It's fine. I don't matter. It doesn't matter to me. I'm fine. I'm serving God. That's all. Makes no difference. You know. So our affections are not on the money, the the you know, all that. So, you know, when uh, uh, at one point in, in the business, uh, things, things were, you know, going really well. Uh, we were making good money uh, and so on. And then I, uh, I hit a point where I had to, you know, I had to stop my business and I had to focus completely on the ministry. And my salary went down 35% in one month, you know, so you can imagine I was doing the business, earning all that money. And then I said, okay, now the time things happen, I have to stop. I have to focus on the, uh, on the church and the ministry. Okay. I have to make the change. But that also meant that when you're in the church, uh, you're working for the church, the church, you know, you're not going to pay the same kind of salary, that you would pay when you're running an IT business. So my salary went down 35%. That's okay. You know, God has been faithful. Maybe you're still blessed. We're still happy. 
I know that if I was working in the IT industry, I could be making six times, seven times more than what I'm making now being a pastor and doing what I'm doing. I, I, I may be working just the same amount if I was in the IT industry, but I, and I could be making seven times more. But this is where God wants me to be. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'm the happiest person. You know, so it doesn't make a difference because our affections are set on things above. So it doesn't bother me. You know, uh, it doesn't bother that, you know, I could be driving a big car like that, but I'm, you know, but I still have a decent car. I'm happy. I live in a decent place and we are happy. Uh, family is doing fine. So, uh, you know, in, in this world is all a matter of you and I choosing our priorities, what is important. Yeah? For us, the important thing is to do the will of God, is to be pleasing to God, is to do the things he called us to do. That's what matters. That's what satisfies our heart. Of course, there are a lot of things that we could pursue and we could achieve and we could be very successful and do this and do that. But, you know, our affections, first thing, our affections, our desires are set on things above. So when that, when you and I get that right, then these things don't matter at all. Doesn't matter. You know, uh, the influence, the pressure of the world, all those things will be around you, but it just doesn't affect you. Why? Because you've made a choice to put your affection on things above. Okay. So we got to pause here. I didn't give you time for questions. We just have three minutes left. I guess we'll have to um, take up questions next week, but anything very quickly. You all with me so far? Yes, but Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so I I just want to seek some advice. So it looks like if um, if you travel from your country, obviously you are expected to. Um, have some money and take some money back home. And in my case, it looks as if um, all the money I'm trying to save, I'm trying to use it on uh, ministry and trying to help people. And even with what I have, it's not even enough to support um, the work we are doing and all this. So sometimes I feel like um, you are here and uh, there is nothing to show off. That is, if I go back home, there is no savings and all the money to has been invested into ministry. So is it wise to continue like that? Or I should just, uh, but it's challenging when it comes to um, working so hard and you have to also get more time for ministry as well as uh, the money that you are saving to, it goes back to the ministry, you know? Mm. So in that case, as a young guy who is not married, who is supposed to save up some money and, you are here with the kingdom of God and there is nothing you can hold on back home. What should be my advice? Should, should there be a balance between what I'm saving? And if I don't put my money into what we are doing too, it looks as if the thing will not go anywhere. Mm. So mm. what is um, financial advice to me? Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just make a statement now, but let's uh, talk about it again on Monday. Uh, we will need a little bit more time on this. But here's the thing. This, this, you know, we have to be wise. And so that's the fourth point we're going to be talking about. That is, we have to be spiritually minded, but earthly wise. Right? So... That's the balance we must have. We have to be spiritually minded, but also earthly wise. So uh, part of living on the earth, living in this world, means that you need to save money to do whatever you have to do for life. 
Um, now, of course, there's nothing, uh, you know, uh, example, example. So I'm trying to be quick, time's up already. Uh, you have another class. So you, you earn some money, uh, you put a certain amount into the work of the ministry, uh, you, have, you will have your expenses, which you have to, of course, pay your bills every month. And then you set aside some money to save for yourself, your future, whatever. So you need to plan like that. Okay, we'll talk more on this uh, next week. Uh, Abraham, just bring this question up again on Monday so we can address it uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, we will stop now because uh, I don't want to take time from your next class. Uh, you need to go for your break. And okay, okay. So let's uh, let's uh, close here and uh, so that you can go for your break and then we'll continue this uh, next week. Could somebody please close in prayer and then uh, we'll go. Somebody could pray and we'll dismiss. Yeah. Pastor, can I pray? Please go. Ahead, Thank you. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning which you have given to us, to God. We pray that, Father God, every every word was what we received, oh God, let it deeply rooted in us, O oh God, Master. We pray that, Father, let the cares of this world and the worries of this world should not shock it, but Lord, Lord, teach us, God, Master, to set our desires, O oh Father God, on you, to fulfill our, Lord, Master, your will. Let, let That should be our aim and our goal in our life, O oh God, Master. We pray that, Father, let these words of Father God, let it, let be able to preserve in our soul, in our heart, in our mind in such a way that it always, oh Lord, Master, energize us, oh Father God, to move further. When the, when when we face those challenges, when we be tempted to worry, Lord, Master, let these words of Father God strengthen us to overcome those challenges, overcome those situations of Father God, so that we can continue to fulfill the will of God, oh God. We can continue to carry the cross what we have given to us, oh God. We thank you for your servant of God, of Father God, bless him, use him mightily, bless his health, bless his life, of Father God. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, continue this on Monday. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you.